<laughs> All right, I guess we'll continue with our special guest speaker. I really appreciate uh, David coming, and I'll just let him take over the floor. David Greasy. Thank you. Um, are, you, are you recording the PA? Um, or just camera? Uh, just recording the room. Just recording the room. Um, if I turn this off, I, I don't like the way it's sounding, actually. Um, is it better off? I, I think it's probably better off. Oh, yeah. great. <laughs> All right. Um, fine. Uh, okay. Uh, it's, it's a little hard to make. I put this up there so I don't have to say it. Um, the talk is going to be in three parts. If I can get to the third part, we'll be lucky. Um, uh, but it's really all very interesting. Um, I, I will give you just a little personal introduction here. Um, I, I got interested quite some time ago in, in opera house and concert hall acoustics. And uh, it, it came to my attention rather suddenly and with force that um, people didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> uh, and since maybe 20 years, I've been trying to figure out um, what really is going on? Um, how can you actually measure what you hear in in a in a concert in a, in an opera? And and this has been a real struggle because it has it has not been an easy thing to do. Um, just a little bit of history. Uh, about 20 years ago, I, I decided that um, the, the spatiality, this feeling that that sound sound is all around you, is due to um, not what anybody else thought it was, but it's due to the fact that when you have a sound coming from the front and the sound coming from the side, they interfere with each other. <laughs> Guess what? And uh, if, if the sound that's coming from the front is not constant frequency but has a little vibrato or something, the interference at this ear is different than the interference at this ear. Consequently, you can get extremely large level differences between the two ears. And and a large amount of what you hear as spatiality is just due to the fact that this sound pressure is not the same as this sound pressure. And the difference is probably 10 dB. I mean, it's not a small effect. It's huge. Um, and I don't think people still don't believe me on that. But, you know, it's one of those things you look at. You know, fine. <laughs> but then I've been a recording engineer for since I, as long as I can remember, 40 years um, at least. And um, uh, another real mystery is that when you, when you get a microphone in front of somebody, um, the sound is real clear. And the recording engineer says, that's good. You know, that's an accent. That's just what I want. But then you pull it away a little bit. And at some point, and it's rather abrupt, it says, oh, you're too far away. And the recording engineer says, nope, put it back close. What? Why? Why does that happen? It's not obvious. It's really not obvious why that happens. Um, so what this talk is, is after studying the distance effect maybe for 10 years now, about five years ago, I, I made a paper at a, a conference, an international conference in acoustics in Tokyo, no, in Kyoto, and then later at an ISRA conference in Iwa, Iwaji. Um, where I proposed that, in fact, the sense of distance is intimately related with pitch. And I, g I gave a paper at this at the AES. It was a very good paper, actually. And uh, this was in New York, I think. And somebody stood up at the end of it and they said, how the hell did you ever think of this? And I said, well, I submitted an abstract to the, the Kyoto conference and to the ISLA saying I would have an answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> and about two weeks before the conference, I realized that I was in hot water because I had no clue. And I did nothing for that two weeks but try everything I could think of and throw it all out. And what was left over was pitch. So you say, like Sherlock Holmes, when you gotten rid of all the impossibilities, what's left over, regardless of how improbable is the truth. Well, it's pitch. This talk is going to be a largely about pitch. Um, and and I, I'll, you know, I want to say a little bit more of an introduction here. Um, the other part of the introduction is, has to do with psychology. The, part, the, the, the talk is really in, in three sections because one is about physics. The next is about psychology, and the next is about acoustics. Notice I don't get to acoustics for quite a while. Because okay. you've got to start with the physics, because I know the physics, I'm a physicist, okay? 
And then you go to psychology. I'm not a psychologist, but I've been thinking about this for years. And then you go to the acoustics. Okay. What's important about the psychology? Um, the, I got taught this in, in the, maybe the hardest way possible. I, um, I'll give you one example, but I have about five. And, and that was um, I, Steve and I, um, there's Steve Barber if you don't know him, very important guy, um, did the acoustics at the Royal Theater in Copenhagen with a layer system. And the purpose of this system was to raise the reverberation time of the theater, which was like about one second, maybe 0.9, something like that. Um, and they wanted it longer. Well, that was good. And it was a fantastic result. It really sounds good. In fact, it sounds much better than their new opera house. You can take my word for it. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, the new opera house costs $500 million, and it's absolutely gorgeous, and everybody who goes there is absolutely blown away. It just doesn't sound good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and the old theater sounds fantastic. And, and the question is, why? Well, it's very interesting. Um, the, the, the chief conductor there is a guy named Mikhail Shunovac, who's a, who's a man. He's a wonderful guy. Really easy to work with, very smart, really good ears. All these things that make the conductor great, I think. Um, but anyway, um, that was a success. And one of the things that was really made it successful to me was this incredible clarity you got out of the singers. They, they could be up here singing, and you had the feeling they were, they were, they were singing to you. And you couldn't ignore them because they were just so clear and so in your face. And at the same time, you had this nice reverberance that Steve and I put in. And that was all great. Well, they said, this is wonderful. You guys are very smart. We have this other theater, which is a shoebox that they're using for drama. Never use a shoebox for drama. Okay, it's the wrong shape. Anyway, it was, a, it was like a 400-seat, 500-seat theater. They called it the New Stage. New Stage, something like that. Um, and um, uh, they were having trouble. They, they had actors on stage, and, and you couldn't really hear the actors in the audience. It was hard to hear the words. And they said, OK, use your magic system, which we'd already installed, to make the actors more audible. I said, I don't, I don't think I can do that. I said, the problem is the miking, because there was nowhere to put the mics near the stage enough that you could get a clean signal. But even you know, even a, a, a super cardio, we actually used the uh, Microtech Gefil microphones, which are a 10 degree beam width above two kilohertz uh, microphone. Uh, and we put that so it was just grazing the actors. Even that didn't work. So, but I, I did some very fancy DSP. I don't want to describe it here, but it, the, the purpose of the DSP was to cut off the reverberation at the end of every word. It worked. So we took that and we set it to the 64 loudspeakers all around the audience, and it worked. It made this, the actors louder and easier to understand. So um, we got the five major drama directors in Copenhagen to come in and to live performance of Chekhov with a full or, uh, uh, audience that didn't have a clue. And I turned this thing on and off every 10 minutes. It was subtle. I mean, it wasn't something that would hit you over the head. And at intermission, they all came back, and we had a conference. And I said, well, what do you think? They said, boy, it works. It makes the, sig the actors more intelligible and louder and we hate it. They're absolutely uniformly unanimous on the fact that it worked and they didn't like it at all. Please don't use it. So we turned it off and went home. <laughs> all right. Why? I said, you guys aren't leaving until you can tell me why it doesn't work. And they hemmed and hawed and hemmed and hawed. And finally somebody said, it makes the actors seem further away. Oh. Really? Yes. And then another one of them said, I would rather that the people didn't hear the words than have the actors seem further away. Because if they don't hear the words, they're going to listen more carefully, which is exactly what I want. And then they all talked about each other, and then they said, you know what I think we should do, they all said more or less unanimously. We should train our actors to speak Danish better. <laughs> so I went back to Sunavant, who was conducting Lohengrin, and I saw the last act of Lohengrin, um, and I came out back to the dressing room and said, how'd it go? I said, they decided they should train the actors to speak Danish better. <laughs> I said, I told them that. None of these actors can speak Danish anymore. It's a lost art. <laughs> 
Okay, enough of that story. The important thing about that is, is there's something really, really important about whether something seems far away or not with regards to its dramatic intensity. The psychology of it is really, really important. And my, my feeling, I, I'm very sensitive to this now, and when I go to a concert in almost any concert hall, I'm usually very disappointed that I can't get this feeling of intensity from the musicians, that they're somewhere over there and they might as well be on the moon or somewhere else, and I have no feeling that they're, they're speaking to me. I'm listening to them, but they're not speaking to me. Okay? And that's what I'm talking about, and that might interest John Allen. Well, I was going to say, did you, sit, did you feel that way the day that you sat in front of them? Because we had you sit there for a reason. Uh, I'm, you're you're going to have to when? Oh, last year. I, at, 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 in Boston? Yeah. In Symphony Hall? Yeah. I'll talk about Symphony Hall. Symphony Hall is an exception. Oh, okay. I was wondering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Symphony Hall is actually very good, and it's very unusual that it's that good. All right. That's very long. I've spent a long time <coughs> wasting everybody's time. Let's get into the talk a little bit more. Um, unexplained phenomena. I've already mentioned some of this. Um, we've been trained to think of the, the ear, the basal membrane, as kind of a piano. You know, it has low keys and has high keys, and they go from the bottom to the top. And you put a note in, and one of the keys goes down, right? That's how we hear sound. That's what everybody says, right? It's nonsense. Why is it nonsense? It's nonsense because the basal membrane has a frequency selectivity of about four semitones. Okay? How are you going to hear it that way? It's just not, it doesn't make sense. Because a musician can hear 1%, quarter of a semitone. I hear 1%. I'm not a great musician. Actually, I'm extremely sensitive to pitch. So. But 1% um, but is good for me. I can reliably... 1% uh, is a sixth of a semitone. So, that's, clearly there's additional frequency selective mechanisms in the ear. Like another problem, the fundamentals of the music instruments are all between 60 hertz and 800 hertz, as is the fundamentals of human voices. But the sensitivity of human hearing is greatest between 500 hertz and 4 kilohertz, as can be seen from the ICC standard loudness curve. This is obvious. Look where the ear is most sensitive. Something very important happens here. Or it wouldn't be like that. What happened? Analysis of frequencies above 2 kilohertz would seem to be hindered by the maximum nerve firing rate of about 1 kilohertz. How do you analyze something that you, that's faster than the clock frequency of your analyzer? How do you do it? The ear is not capable of doing FFT analysis. Surprise! <laughs> Why has evolution placed such an emphasis on a frequency range that's difficult to analyze? All right. Well, okay. Um, maybe the harmonics are important, but let's think about the harmonics. Let's say, say um, my voice is 125 hertz, so roughly plus or minus. Uh, if you go to 2 kilohertz, there's four harmonics inside a basal membrane filter, right? Well, say somebody else is talking and they have a, a vocal frequency of, say, 200 hertz. Okay, they have three harmonics inside there. Okay, how are you going to get them apart? The, the filter responds to some, some mixture. How can you hear them both separately? All right, how can we separate them? How is it possible that in a good hall, I'm talking about Boston Symphony here, or Jordan Hall, or one of the great Boston halls, of which there are many, and, and Boston absolutely blessed to have such wonderful halls. You go somewhere else in the world, they just don't exist. <laughs> How is it possible that good hall we can routinely detect the azimuth pitch and timbre of three or more sound sources at the same time? Even in a concert, say, the string quartet playing on the, the, the front of Symphony Hall, and you're back in the front of the first balcony. And the, the distance, angular distance between these guys from where you sit is this. And you can reliably hear that the first violin is there, and the viola is there. Try it sometime. It's amazing. You can do it. The IITDs and the ILDs are minuscule. Why do some concert halls prevent you from doing this? What can you do about it? 
Another one, why are microphones invariably placed closer to the musicians than the audience? Are they really trying to record the sound that's heard in the hall? Okay, I'm not going to get into that problem, probably, in this talk. Too bad. Um, but that has to do with how it's played back. The microphones are fine. Now, here's the biggie. The hair cells in the basal membrane respond only to negative pressure. They're half-wave rectifiers. About as nonlinear a device as you can possibly get. And yet we think we can hear distortion at levels below a tenth of a percent. Yeah? John says, yeah, he can. Yeah. All the time. <laughs> All the time. All right. Another thing. Importance of pitch. Why do all creatures, great and small, communicate to each other with sounds that have a defined pitch? All of them. Well, not all of them, but God, all. So many, many, many. Why do humans whisper only when that's what we have to? What's so important about pitch? All right. I've been fascinated with this for a long time, particularly perception of muddiness in a recording, lack of dramatic clarity in a hall. This led to a study of near and far, which humans can determine immediately on hearing a sound. Immediately. You know, ex you know whether it's close to you or far away. Immediately. And that's really important. <laughs> okay. It's got to be like that. But how do you do it? That's really. An intense period of elimination led to the conclusion that near and far depends on pitch. If loudness <coughs> is controlled, you cannot tell the distance of a whispered sound from a single channel of information. You can do it binaurally, but you can't do it through a single channel. However, the distance is a monaural thing. This near and far thing, if it's pitched, you can tell single, single channel, one microphone. That's why you move the microphone. That's one channel, OK? <laughs> it's one channel. All right, it's not a binaural phenomenon. Another intense period of elimination found that the major cue for muddiness or distance was the coherence of harmonics in the vocal formant range 1,000 hertz to 4,000 hertz. Coherence, what does that mean? Here's an example, okay, you can't see because it's behind the speaker. I have a little, uh, a little thingy there. Let's see what happens if I try to play it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The idea here is there's supposed to be different distances from yeah. it. I yeah. mean, yeah. The, one, the one that starts is really far away and kind of muddy, and then as it comes one, closer, two, it gets three, closer four, to it. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, this eight, one's far nine, right. ten. One, two, this starts three, to be okay. four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you can ten. Record one, there. two, three, and this four, is too five, close. six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right. What's different about this? They're all the same loudness. They have exactly the same frequency content because I messed them up with all pass filters. Um, so they're, they're exactly the same frequency content, same loudness. Uh, what's different is the harmonics in the one that's too close to you are absolutely coherent. And what does it mean by that? All right. Well, I'll get there in a minute. As you know, all these questions become clear with a basic realization, and that is the phase relationship to harmonics from a complex tone contain information about the sound source that created them. And these phase relationships are scrambled by early reflections. For example, I, I said this all right, I, the fundamental 120. The tone is created when pulses of air when the vocal cords open. The, the vocal cord is a delta function generator. It goes pop, 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 pop. All right? Which means that exactly once in the fundamental period, all the harmonics are in phase. They absolutely have to be. A typical basal membrane filter at 2,000 hertz contains at least four harmonics. And the pressure on the membrane is maximum when all these harmonics are in phase. And it reduces because they're all different frequencies, so they're going to drift apart in phase. And, and slowly, the amplitude is going to go down. The result is a strong amplitude modulation at the fundamental frequency of the source. So you can take a single basal membrane filter at 2 kilohertz and look at the modulation in its amplitude and tell the frequency of the source. You can tell, as it turns out, a whole lot more. Is that pitch? That's pitch. The fundamental is what people detect as the pitch. All right. When this modulation is absent or noise-like, the sound is perceived as distant. 
Here's an example. This is 1600 hertz Bowser membrane filter. Actually, it's a standard IEC clear doctor filter. And I took the, this is the, the word two from my voice. And you can see that's what you call strong modulation. That's just the output of one basal membrane filter. This is the same thing, only that's two kilohertz. And you can notice that it's modulated too. It's a little bit different, but this modulation and that modulation are in phase. All right. What if we turn this into nerve firing rates? This, this is supposed to go from 0 to 20 over here, but I took it apart because, because I, at the time I made this diagram, I thought the basal membrane would work one way, and now I think it works another, and I had to get rid of the scale. But um, you can see here, this, this is accurate in decibels. So you're looking at the dB variation in the amplitude of those modulations, and the solid is 1,600 hertz, and the dotted is, is 2 kilohertz again. And you can see they're in phase, and they have enormous amplitude in terms of dB, 20 dB. AM radio. How many people here have built AM radios when they were little with tubes or crystals or things like this? Yeah. Yeah. All right. AM radio consists of a carrier at a fixed high frequency that's been linearly modulated by low frequency signals. Does everybody know what linearly modulated means? I'm not going to explain it. You'll have to go learn. Okay. The AM receiver is a half-wave rectifier. That's the crystal in the crystal set. It's a vacuum diode in the, in the better radios. And what happens is they cut the bottom half of the waveform off, and then instead of having a carrier, you actually have a DC signal or AC signal that's exactly the modulation. You also have a lot of other stuff. Rectification can be viewed as a kind of sampling, and it also produces aliases of the, of the modulation. Uh, but in an AM radio, you're, 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 you're sampling at 1 megahertz. <laughs> that would make the sigma delta guys happy, right? <laughs> uh, you're sampling at 1 megahertz, and your frequencies go up to 10 kilohertz, and so that's okay. There's no problem with aliasing. All right. In the basal membrane, however, the carrier is very close to the frequencies of modulation, and the aliases are problematic. So a lot of what I'm going to, or some of what I'm going to talk about here is how the brain gets rid of these aliases, okay? Or at least I'll mention the problem. I just did mention the problem. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. How come nothing changed? Hmm. There we go. All right. The interesting thing about it is that the carrier in this amplitude modulation, in this, this, this looks like an AM radio, right? That's, imagine the, the, the little dots are one megahertz and you've got an AM radio. But the thing is, that carrier is not a carrier. It's not made by a crystal. It's an artifact of the filter, and it's actually created by the harmonics themselves. And they've been filtered to look like that. And the filter has a finite bandwidth, so actually there's a great deal of frequency variation inside that carrier. It's not a real carrier. It's something else. So that's what I'm trying to say here. When, when, you, when you rectify by the hair cells, you produce aliases that are both broadband and highly audible. Okay, but the, the interesting thing about it is they're broadband, whereas the modulations are not broadband. The modulations are very, very sharply uh, pitched. <laughs> That's what happens if you take this signal, where, this one, this one, if you take that signal and you have to rectify it, that's what comes out. <laughs> okay. The interesting thing is you can understand it. Listen. Listen carefully. Ha! Ah, you can understand it. There's a lot of garbage in there, but, but what you want to hear is there, too. Okay, you got to get rid of the garbage. How do you do it? Recovering linear signals. So recover linear signals with hair cells. We have to somehow combine and compare the outputs for many overlapping critical bands. Well, that's what the ear is. Many overlapping critical bands. Why is it like that? Well, it has to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Since for most signals the artifacts are not constant in time, we must also average the hair cell firings over a period of time. And in my model, 100 milliseconds it seems to be the right time. And I have some reasons to, to talk about why that time is, works. But the primary reason is if you make a model of this thing and you put sounds in, you look at what comes out, if you use 75 milliseconds, it just doesn't work as well. And if you use 100 milliseconds, things start looking pretty darn good. So there's other reasons for that. 100 milliseconds in human hearing is very, very common time constant. If you ask what's the time constant for determining loudness, for example, it's 100 milliseconds. You've got to have 100 milliseconds before you can tell how loud something is. Why is that? Well, actually, <laughs> it's because this particular processing is basic to the way that you hear. You're going to find a whole lot of things that are going to have this time constant because this is where the system probably starts. Because the carrier is broadband, the aliases are also broadband, and the signals are generally narrowband. So broadband signals can be ignored if you have some sort of consciousness that can sort these kinds of things out. And the ear clearly does have that. All right, here's an amplitude modulation based Basler membrane model. Well, you have the usual filter bank. Every model has that, okay? This is everywhere in the literature. There's a rectifier. Every model has that, too. And then you have some kind of thing. You, if this were logarithmic, then lots of models would have that, too. But I'm saying, well, actually, I tried log, and it's interest, it gives interesting results. But boy, linear log works a whole lot better. Now, why is that? Well, think of an AM radio. Say you've got a frequency at 500 hertz in your AM radio, and you've got another one at 375, for example. <laughs> And you're going you're gonna to demodulate that with a logarithmic diode. What are you going to get out? Garbage. You don't want to use a nonlinear rectifier at an AM radio. If the air is an AM radio, you don't want to use a logarithmic detector. That's it. So what I'm doing here is saying, OK, well, we'll, we'll have a little circuit here that has a time constant. What time constant? I don't know. I tried 10 milliseconds. It works. Um, that might need some research, and maybe somebody can refine it. But the idea is, out, you cut out of this filter, out of the, uh, you get out of this thing, okay? Well, this circuit goes here where the linear log is. So first, you've got to do some sort of averaging of the of the of the diode output, or you get nothing worth having. So you have a, a low pass filter here, and then you look at the level of it, and you do a log x over x of it, and then you put that into a gain value. And what comes out is something which is logarithmically proportional to the signal pressure here, but only <coughs> after a time constant, and the time constant is 10 milliseconds. So if, if a signal is rapidly rising, you get a little pulse out of this, and then the signal adapts, and, and, it, and what comes out is, is, is proportional to the log of the signal pressure. But for a brief moment, it was, it was not. It was linear. And with a 10 millisecond time constant, frequency, say, of 100 hertz or or 50, you know, 500 hertz or anything are linear. They're going to come out linear. So that's, that's my amplitude uh, modulation Bazard model. Okay, so it has an output. Here's the output here, and these are these modulations. And notice I high-pass filtered them as well as low-pass filtered, and that's arbitrary. It just made it easier to program. What does that do? Well, this is the only thing I can think of. This is going to Sherlock Holmes thing. Um, Try a lot, lots of things. <laughs> you got to try something that you could actually build with neurons. That's the only fair thing. You, that's the only thing that's fair. Okay. Well, this kind of delay line is known to exist. There, there, there are models for lots of things, particularly for azimuth detection and binaural hearing, where you have a delay line composed of lots of neurons, all of which delay a nerve firing for a per period of time before passing it on to the next one. Well, I'm, I'm sampling at 44.1, so. Um, I, my neurons have a delay of 22 milliseconds. Okay. What's actually happening in the ear? That's, that's absurd. I mean, it really, in the ear, it's got to be longer than that because this is too inefficient. Um, well, certainly if you're a bird or something like that, you don't want to have all those neurons tied up doing this thing. Um, so, so anyway. Um, but this works okay. So now, the idea is what do you do with that? Well, um, say you're looking for a particular frequency out of this. Um, and... And that frequency has a period of five of these samples. So 
I've drawn here one, two, three, four, five, and then there's a tap, and then one, two, three, four, five, and then there's a tap, 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 tap every five, okay? And I'm going to sum the nerve firings here down. Oops, this is dying. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, well. So, anyway, so much for the uh, laser pointer. Um, so, uh, so you, you get all these taps and you sum them. Well, if the uh, modulation happens to be in step with all these, um, these taps, then the output of this sum is going to be really strong. Okay. Um, and if it's not in step, it won't be strong. That's easy. So I only showed two of these things, but, but in the model that I built, I used 100 or maybe 150. Oh, thank you, Steve. Does this work? Oh, it works much better. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you for somebody. <laughs> Remember to get it back to me. <laughs> so what comes out here is, is um, um, a very strong modulated output at particular frequencies. And it's, it's been window averaged. In other words, you're looking at a sliding average of 100 milliseconds. And, and, and this, this, this whole thing slides through. Um, an interesting thing about this is, of course, it takes 100 milliseconds for, the, for a particular modulation to completely fill this delay line, okay? But if there's not much else in here, like you have a sudden onset of a sound and this part is empty, <laughs> you start getting output immediately. And as time goes on, it gets more and more accurate in frequency. But the point is you get an output immediately. Within 20 milliseconds, you've got something usable. And if the tone goes on for 100, it gets more and more accurate. So this is very nice biologically. It gives you an almost immediate output, and it's, it, it's very fine. All right, in, the number, in, in our model, the number of taps for each frequency is simply the number of taps that fits. OK, so the number of taps as a function of frequencies is simply the, width, the window times the frequency. In our model, the output of each summing neuron is divided by n, so, so I want to have a more or less constant output. All right. Now, what's the property of a comb filter of this type? The, the frequency sharpness of each summing node, the full width of hack maximum FWHM, is just the frequency divided by n. Isn't that interesting? It's true. Weird. Um, in practice, the sharpness is actually higher, and actually a lot higher, as the, filter, the, the input to the filter is not sinusoidal but it's sharply peaked at the frequency of the fundamental. Let's go back and look at, at these, these pictures. You see, this is not a sinusoid. It's more of, of a series of delta functions. So, so that increases the selectivity of the filter. Well, why is that? It turns out that the harmonics, the, this filter um, is equally sensitive to harmonics of the signal as it is to the fundamental. So that if you made a, a circuit that was supposed to detect 100 hertz, it would also detect 200 hertz, and it would also detect 300 hertz. But if you look at the sharpness of those frequencies, it's much higher. It's actually, the, the 200 hertz is twice as sharp, and the 300 hertz is three times as sharp. So the sum of that is actually much sharper than you would expect from the, uh, the full width of half, half mechanism and just being f over m. Now, the, the artifact has interesting consequences for harmony as the pitch pattern produced by both major and minor triads is strong up with the root frequency. So if you're interested in harmony, you've always wondered why it doesn't matter what inversion you play a triad with. It sort of sounds the same. Here's why. It, it comes right out of, of this comb filter. Um, this is a major triad of two inversions. This is 200 hertz, 250 hertz, and 300 hertz. That's the solid line. 200 hertz, 250 hertz, and 150 hertz, the fifth lowered by an octave. Okay, that's the dotted line. Well, okay, so at 150 hertz, in the one that was lowered by an octave, you get 150 hertz. Surprise! <laughs> Everything else is just the same. So the pattern, the pattern hasn't changed, really. Uh, this is the minor triad. Interesting about this is to compare the major and minor triads. Oops. And you can see, actually, that... that they're actually very different. Notice that you, the, the really strong output in both major and minor triads is the subharmonic at 100 hertz. And that's, of course, because it's an octave and fifth. And the octave and fifth produces a false base at 100 hertz. End result. We've used the physiological model of the basilar membrane to convert sound pressure into demodulated fluctuations in nerve firing rates for a large number of overlapping critical bands. 
our physiological model of frequency separation mechanisms capable of analyzing the modulations in each band into perhaps hundreds of frequency bins. Strong narrow band signals of particular frequencies can be selected for further processing. The interesting thing about these summing nodes, these, is this is another neural stream. Interesting. Now say you had one of these for the left here, and you had another one for the right here, which you do. And you decided, oh, there's a really strong peak here at 500 hertz. Good. Let's look at the ITD of the fluctuations. Guess what? The ITD is that exactly what you get from the time delay of that signal. And you can localize it. Very interesting. I'll show you, I'll show you something that proves it in a minute. But even, also, even more interesting, actually, is the interoral level. Does anybody know what ITD is? Interoral time difference. It's the time between when a signal comes this way, it hits this ear first, and then hits that one later. And the time difference gives you the azimuth. Well, the level difference is also important, OK? So you get a signal coming in here. It's kind of blocked by the ear, so this ear is less loud than this ear, OK? Well, the level difference at low frequencies is minuscule. So the hearing uses ITD exclusively at low frequencies. You all know this. And as you go up in frequency, the, the, uh, the interval level difference becomes, becomes um, more important for localization. Well, the interesting thing is because you're dealing here with high harmonics. You're dealing with 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 hertz bands. The head shadowing is enormous. So if you're listening to a violin playing over there at 500 hertz, and you're listening, actually, your brain is using the 4 kilohertz signal to find out the azimuth, which it can do. The head shadowing is enormous. Which is why you can actually localize these incredibly small angular differences. You're using high frequencies to do it. And you're, you're, you're using this kind of thing to separate out. See, the nice thing about this is this might be one violin, and this might be another. And this output fluctuation that comes out here, you can analyze for azimuth. And you can analyze this one for azimuth, too, separately. So you can say, oh, that violin is there, and that violin is there. And they don't get mixed up. The model contains several parameters. The choice of a log-linear model for the hair cells, not a fully logarithmic detector. And that's it. the reason for that, this choice is clear. I will, I will play this, OK? Um, this is a, a source. That's a two violin playing a minor second of parts. A major second. Major second. All right. That, that's pretty close. Uh, and and uh, if I use a logarithmic detector to detect that, it sounds like this. You can still hear them, <laughs> but you don't want to. Okay, it's not good, but it's a whole lot better. Okay. That's the choice there. Choice of 10 milliseconds of the response time. I don't know, it works. Choice of 100 milliseconds window. That's choice with consistent, if it's consistent with earlier work on localization, I'll show you that later. <coughs> the use of equal weighting for all the taps chosen for simplicity. Um, the ear may be sophisticated enough to vary the tap weighting. I looked at that and said, oh, that's an echo canceler. I wonder if the ear can actually adjust those if there's a strong early reflection and cancel it out. Maybe. I'm not going to go there right yet. This is 1 to 10. It's the same thing I was just playing you, um, analyzed by this detector. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Somewhere in there. Notice that the one is one, two, three. Notice the sharpness of this. The grid here is half a percent. Half a percent. That's a twelfth of a second. And these are, these are not constant with time. So what, it's, what it, you're seeing here is an average of the pitch over a 100 millisecond window. 
And even that is good. So this is the output of that model. These are probably down here mostly um, subharmonic showing up. Okay, I could have cut this off by starting the graph at 90. I guess I just didn't. Please. How many of the summing nodes are you assuming in this? Well, here there's, there's a half a percent, and I'm going from 80 to 160. You figure it out. Actually, yeah, it, it takes a while. That's, I wrote this in C because MATLAB completely chokes. Um, it's, it's not a, a great thing. Yeah, no, it, it takes a while to do this. Um, when I first did it in MATLAB, I said, I, I can't study this. It takes too long. Um, but this, doing this takes about two minutes to calculate that, which is fine for me. I, I, I'm that patient. <laughs> All right, well, what happens, what happens now? I played you that at the beginning. I played that signal that, that sort of got messed up with all pass filters. Well, here I'm going to mess it up, not with all pass filters, but with real reverberation. And this reverberation is a two second reverberation. And it's done with decaying noise. It's exponentially decaying noise, because I didn't want to actually have discrete reflections in it. Um, but the important thing about it is the direct to reverberate ratio is minus 10 dB. That means there's 10 times as much energy in the reverberation as there is in the direct sound in this particular instance. But because it's a two second reverberation time, the amount of reverberation that falls in the first 100 milliseconds isn't that great. Which means that there's enough direct sound in that 100 millisecond re region that you can get a pretty good idea of what all the pitches are. We can compare this to this. You see the shapes here go there. And basically, oops, basically everything has the same shape. It's just not as high. And the interesting thing about that is, well, unfortunately, this is a binaural signal. I'm going to play it back with the loudspeakers. It's going to sound kind of far away in this room. You play this on headphones, and this sounds absolutely clear. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It does sound, even to me in this, anyway, in this speaker, it sounds pretty clear. Um, well, what happens if we do the same <coughs> trick, but we're going to make a one-second reverberation time instead of a two-second reverberation time? Um, and now, of course, it's one second and it's minus 10 dB. The D to R stayed the same, so there's more energy in, in the, that 100 millisecond window. It sounds like this. One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Sounds far away. Sounds distant. Okay. And now, if we look at the picture, we see that um, the one is sort of there, the two is missing, the three is really missing. This is just noise. Four comes out strongly. Five, I don't know. So the interesting thing about pitch is, this is, this is the two second. That's the one second. Note, note what happened to this one. Whoop, gone. Whoop. Could you play this after we finish it? Sure, this is, this is the, uh, the two second one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is the uh, one second. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is much more obvious on headphones. Sorry, sorry about that. But anyway, let me move on. Um, these are two <coughs> binaural violins uh, separated plus and minus 15 degrees in azimuth. Um, and there, there, there was playing that note, that signal I just played you before with the two violins separated by a, a major second. Uh, and you can see that, the, oh boy, they're very well separated in frequency. No problem there. This is, this is really sharp. Again, this is half a percent uh, uh, frequency selectivity here. Uh, and, and this violin is clearly, um, this is the left ear, and this violin is clearly on the right because when you go to the right ear, it's really strong. This violin is clearly on the left because you go to the one on the right and it's missing. It's completely gone. Okay, so at this frequency, well, actually, this is a combination with several bands. Um, and I, I can't get into how I combine them, not because I don't want to, because I don't really know what the right way to do it is. Um, this, this way is, I don't do this face coherently because it turns out that well, there's some reasons that you can't do that. Um, so this is, this is looking, this sums the modulations and not the phases of the modulations, if that makes sense. 
All right, but now I'm going to add some reverb to it, <laughs> OK? Uh, this, this, this is those same two violins um, with, with the one second reverberation time on, on it. That's the one. This 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 one to that one, you can see that that we've lost a lot. <laughs> All right, um, the pitch acuity is, is reduced, and the pitches of the right hand violin are nearly gone, but there's still a little bit of discrimination for the violin on the left. That's this one, so you can tell what the pitches are. And in fact, if you listen to this, it's easy to hear the pitches. Okay, so your ears. I don't know if the model's, if the ear is actually better than the model, or the ear is actually, the model's actually showing you what you hear, and you, you hear these bugs. Yeah. Maybe that's what's happening. The model is, is pretty close to what the ear hears, I think. Okay, why is pitch robust in the presence of reverberation? Acuity <coughs> is reduced by reverberation, but reverberation is not capable of, of completely scrambling the phases of the harmonics. And some third octave bands will always still contain significant modulation. And if you simply select the ones that have what looks like reasonable uh, modulation, then you get good pitch out of that. But it's not as good as if they were all have good pitch. Well, what about timbre? What is timbre? What does timbre mean? Well, timbre is sort of the amplitude of the different harmonic bands. For voices, timbre is the vocal format. It's the vowel. So A, E, I, O, U is a good example of timbre. Okay, they all have different mixtures of harmonics. And the human ear is very, very highly attuned to that because otherwise it couldn't understand speech. Okay. So, so timbre is really important. And what it is is the, the strength of these modulations in different critical bands. All right. So what I did was I... I decided, well, if we were relying on the amplitude of these modulations in each band to determine timbre, then the timbre gets scrambled by reflections. And in fact, the major perception of, the, of a distant source is that the timbre has changed. That's when we listen to what's happening here, you, you might say, well, it doesn't sound distant to me, but you, you, you will say the timbre's been screwed up. All right. Right. So, um, so I changed my program to make something I call a, a, a timbre map. I, I modified the model to select the most prominent frequency in each 10 millisecond time slice, and then map, map the amplitude in third octave bands for that frequency. The result is a timbre map, I'll show you. This is one and two, this is one, and this is two, and, and you can see the O sound, O, and the wa, wa sound here, this one. I guess it's an ah sound. Oop, this one's dead too now. <laughs> <laughs> I use them up. <laughs> um, and oh, no, it's coming back. I guess if I let it sit a minute, it comes back. Um, and this is the oo sound, okay? And you see the low frequency bands are much more prominent in the oo sound than they are in the, the ah sound, anyway. They're different. Well, what happens if we add a reverberation to this? This, this is the two second reverberation, okay? It was the one I just played. I won't play it because I'm running out of time. And, and you can actually see that the oo sound and the ah sound are still different. So, so this isn't all that bad. But if we add the one second one, we get this. So timbre is really scrambled by the reflections. Pitch less so, but timbre is bad. But what about non-coherent sources? What, so far, I've been only considering sources that emit complex tones with a distinct pitch. OK, well, what about, what about anything else? If you take pink noise and you, you band limit it in a third octave band, there's fluctuations there because it's noise. Okay? And the narrower the band, the more noise you get. And there's a, a relationship to that that has to do with the uncertainty and all that. And if I were a better physicist, I could give you the formula right off the top of my head. But I'm not going to do that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so you have a band limit that has noise-like modulations. OK, well, that's very interesting. If you, if you narrow band pick noise, you get amplitude fluctuations in each third octave band, and you can vocalize them. ITD. Now, ILD doesn't work here, because you can have the same sound pressure in both ears. But the modulations, if the source is coherent, if you say you have a speaker sitting on stage playing pick noise, 
okay? And, and you, you put it in your ear, you can localize it, you know? Even though the level in your two ears is the same. Is ILD localization difference? What is ILD? ILD is interoral level difference. Sorry, sorry. Um, it's the level difference. Well, the pink noise in my example there has also a large ILD. Um, but the ITD is, is very interesting. I'll, um, I'm going to mention something here, which is really cool. Um, this explains why in a good hall we can easily distinguish the average azimuth of the string se section, even if they play like modern strings do with enormous amounts of vibrato, which are not synchronized at all, so there's no phase coherence in any harmonic. I was at a concert of the BSO about a month ago, and I was absolutely blown away. It was Tom Kukma um, doing a Haydn uh, symphony and then the Haydn cello concerto with Yo-Yo Ma. Was very cool. Um, and he had the strings play with no vibrato. And he cut up the strings that were only 40 strings on stage. And they were all the young people, and they could, damn it, they could play it. <laughs> they could play it without going out of tune. And I'm sitting there with my eyes closed saying, wow! They localized like a single instrument. The whole violin section was right there. Because they were all playing harmonics coherently. And, and you say, well, how can they do that? Well, say each musician is, is tuning his instrument to, say, a percent and a half, which they can do. Well, you look at how far out of phase that goes during a typical note. It's not that far out of phase. But even more so, it's very likely the violin's all phase locked because they're all playing in the same acoustic field. They're all playing the same note. The sound pressure on stage is enormous. They're going to lock. So if the violinist can get close to the right pitch, it's going to go bonk. And it was the most outrageous sound. I was absolutely blown away. I said, this is what I wanted to hear. It was fantastic. Just completely different sounds. So the, the onset of this signal is absolutely time synchronous. And it's only the modulations that have, have, have a time delay. And so I, I did this, and then I swapped it for the next one, and then I swapped it back and forth like this for about eight times. And you put this on headphones and go listen, and go bing, 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 bing. Just to prove that the modulations are localizable by ITD. Oh, this is bandpass filtered at 2,000 hertz. So there's absolutely no frequ low frequencies here. There is no frequency here that the ear can directly analyze. It's all above the nerve firing rate. <coughs> Summary. We've shown the human ear has evolved to analyze fluctuations or modulations in the amplitude of the basal membrane motion at frequencies above 1,000 hertz, and not necessarily the average amplitude of the motion. As long as the phases of the harmonics that create the modulations are not altered by reflections, the modulation from each source can be separated by frequency and separately analyzed for pitch, timbre, azimuth, and distance. So what we have here is something that takes sounds that come in at all different frequencies to you, and it sorts them into separate neural streams, which can be analyzed and separately worked on one way or another. Modulation, especially when separated, carry more information about the sound sources than the fundamental frequencies and allow precise determination of pitch, timbre, and azimuth. All these perceptions depend on the ear's ability to perceive the direct sound from the source. There is no acoustical measure approved by anybody that actually measures the strength of the direct sound. The closest you get is ISCC. The problem with ISCC, and there's, a, there's a several of them, the big problem is it's only sensitive to lateral reflections. So if you have a medial reflection, ISCC will say it's not there, no problem. Whereas this is a monoral thing, doesn't matter what the direction the reflection comes from, it's going to screw you. So how do we get there? Huh? How do we get there? How do we get where? To a measurement system. That measures All right. Well, tell you what. There it is. I don't know how to calibrate this, but it's there. If you can say, ah, that's great. This is OK. That's bad. We got it. This is 
a violin. No, this is speech. But you can do the same with a violin. Just have to calibrate it. Again. So you have somebody talking up there on stage or through your fine PA system. You go out, record it binaurally, and you analyze it. And does it work? Does it work? I don't know. That's the best I can do, John. <laughs> I think it's a slip well, forward. But, but what you're saying, well, I think you should repeat it. Um, if I understand what you just said, we should take something, uh, an original source of some kind. Yes. And a performer. Of, of, of some program material, whatever you might yeah. decide it might be. It might have to be several things. Yes. And record that in a certain way. Yes. And play that back in other rooms from other sound systems and see what we get. With I'm not saying system. that at all. And then compare them? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if you want to, if you want to find out, I'm interested in concert halls, you might be interested in movie theaters. I'm interested in both. I would, I would say um, you, you go into the audience with microphones in your ears like I do and you record what you hear. And you can take it back to the laboratory and say, does this allow you to hear tabber or not? Well, you can listen to it right away. You can tell whether it allows you to or not if, you, if you're used to this. I mean, but the fact is that the fact that I can listen to this by no recording and say, yeah, this is good, and no, that one's shitty, um, is not going to prove anything to anybody. But if you can show them one of these pictures and say, look, it's not working because of this, I think it's, it's more powerful. And, and it becomes person independent. At least that's my thought. So I'm saying, first of all, the problem with the concert hall is you can't measure it when it's empty. Because these, these perceptions I have here are, are incredibly dependent um, on, say, stage acoustics. If you put an orchestra on stage, it's a completely different environment. Um, and nobody measures with an orchestra on stage. Why? They're union guys. They won't let you do it. Um, very rarely they'll let you do it. Um, Depends what you measure. Well, you, you have to, you have to do, have to measure something. No, no. I mean, when, you know, like, uh, I think the latest, even your measurements of reverberation time in Sipping Hall were done occupied. Um, they were they were done very with a very special thing with Larry Kierkegaard, and they were done with big balloons, which is not the greatest way to make anything. But they're they're unique data. I don't have any other any other measurement of Boston Symphony. And they say the most amazing things, which I'll say now because I'm not probably going to get to this section of the talk anyway. Um, and that is, if you look at Boston Symphony uh, and you plot the decay of reverberation as a function of time using a 100 millisecond window, which I think is important, not, not a backward integration, but a 100 millisecond window, you find that in the first 50 or 100 milliseconds of that, the decay time is one second at 1,000 hertz. So it goes down about 10 dB at a one second rate at 1,000 hertz and above. You go to 500 hertz, it's gone. It's 1.8, 1.9 seconds, nice and flat. 250 hertz, likewise. Low frequencies, it behaves the way you think it ought to. High frequencies, it's doing something completely different. Why? Well, that's in the third half of the title. Let me, let me just go on a little bit. Um, at this point, I'm going to do demos. So I want to, I want to play you some of this stuff. And we'll see um, what, what comes out of that. Um, I, I have here, um, well, let's, let's start with, I have here, OK, I should explain what this is. Um, this is, um, I'm playing back, I have five speakers. Uh, there's two in the back and two in the front and one in the center. And uh, the, the two in the front are playing. Uh, I made an image model of Boston Symphony. It couldn't be simpler. Just a rectangular box. Okay. And I took all the reflections that come from the front of a particular seat and put them in these speakers. Okay. And I, I also have like a, a little 10 degree window in that. And the ones that fall in the 10 degree window from the front go in here. Or maybe it was plus or minus 20 degrees. Okay. And so the reflections, some of them go into here, some of them go into there, and all the ones that come from behind you go to those speakers. Okay. And I can play that, so let's do it. Um, I'm going to use a speech signal. I'm going to turn off the direct sound, 
In language, in arithmetic and in words, I'm beginning with small set of letters. In arithmetic, in arithmetic and in numbers, I'm giving the first of the jumps to two digits, with the help of the symbol, the zero, the principle of position, and the concept of base. In language, in arithmetic and in words, I'm beginning with small set of Okay, how many people find the reverberation coming mostly from the front? Okay, people in the front half of the room find it coming from the front. Surprise. But actually, if you're right in the middle, it does come from the front. And the reason is, anybody give me the reason? It comes from the front. <laughs> people, you can say this to an acoustician, Leo for example. The reverberation comes from front. Oh no, it has to be, it, you know, everybody knows that reverberation is completely uniform after a certain length of time, and therefore, you know, it should come from all around you. Nonsense, it comes from the front. Why? Well, because the sound starts from the front, okay? It starts bouncing around in front, then it works its way to the back, and by the time it gets to the back, it's decayed, okay? So, in the front, it's always louder in the front, because it started earlier. It's keeping going. Okay? It has to be that way. I don't know. It's a fundamental mistake in, in the way people thought about reverberation from the very first when they started using the mean free path argument. Okay, we'll get into this physics. <laughs> um, but anyway. You say th reverberation is louder in the front than it is in the back. Yes. As is the direct sound. It's true. As is the direct sound. In many um, Yes. And, and, and if you're in the middle of, exactly in the middle of Boston Symphony, there's a time effect, so. You know, you hear a big crash up front, and it goes sailing over the back, and hits the back wall, comes back at you. Okay. That, that's cool. I love it. But um, in, on, for the most part, reverberation comes from the front. And Michael Barron, bless him, went out and measured it. So if you read Barron's revised theory of reverberation, big news. Hey, it comes from the front. Great. Um, we all think it comes from the front. Yes. You know, I think I think some of that fallacy comes from the fact that when people measure rever reverberation in the rear of a hall or something, they're measuring the ratio. There's, there's more reverberation. I mean, there's, what's left in the back? <laughs> it's mostly reverberation, yeah. Yeah. but it's not, it's not stronger. Yeah, it's, not, it's, not, it's not loud. Right. No, it's but not the direct louder. sound is so much weaker in the back that they kind of... Yeah, I know, but I turned off the direct sound. sound. I have no direct sound here. It's only reflection. Anyway, okay, so, but now, let, take a listen to this. I'm going to turn the direct sound on, and, and this is, uh, okay. Um, if I set this to 3 dB, I get exactly a 10 dB um, direct to rear ratio. At least I measured all the energy and the channels, and I found out, as, as I had intended when I calculated it, exactly 10 dB stronger total energy from the speakers than it is from the front. So I set this. Now, so this is minus 10 dB direct to rear ratio. This is not fair to the people in the back. Let me raise this now. I'm going to make it 8 dB. There's this 8 minus 8 dB direct to ratio. Okay, everybody ready? In language, in many words, I'm beginning with small set of letters. In arithmetic, in arithmetic, in numbers, I'm beginning with just two digits. How many people can localize that to the center? The principle of position and the concept of place. In language, in arithmetic, in numbers, I'm beginning with small set of letters. In arithmetic, in arithmetic, in numbers, I'm beginning with just two digits. With the help of the symbol zero. The principle of position and the concept of place. In the words, I'm going to be small set of letters. In the arithmetic, in the arithmetic, in the numbers, I'm going to be first to judge the digit. With the help of the symbol zero, the principle of position and the concept of place. In the Okay, this is not fair. Because this is not an anechoic chamber. So the reverberation here is stronger than it would be if this were anechoic. And the, the threshold is not valid. But it's interesting that you can hear it, OK? I want you to hear the difference. To me, the, the psychological impact when the direct sound is there is completely different than when it's not. Let me just play that. Just, just think about that. In language, in everything in the world, I'm beginning with small set of letters. 
in arithmetic, you can be many numbers and you can go through just a few digits. We think of a symbol of zero, the principle of position, and the... Now, I don't have any trouble understanding this. I guess I've heard it about a thousand times, so... Um, but uh, I, think, I think it's intelligible either way. But it sure isn't pleasant, and it's not <coughs> attention grabbing. Now I'm going to do something different with this. I'm going to <clears throat> I'm going to play that. But I'm, I'm going to take the reverberation and delay it 20 milliseconds, which is much closer to what you would get in Boston Symphony. Okay. The, what I was playing is the reverberation started really right away, and now it's going to give a 20 millisecond time delay. And now listen to it. Okay. And I'm going to go back. Let's see. We've got it. We've got it at 3dB again. Okay. Where it was really not audible before. In language, in a few many words, you begin with a small sentence. Yes, I got the wrong one. That's in arithmetic, in a few many words. I'm sorry, I played the wrong one. Um, symphony plus 20, no, plus 20. Okay. And what do we got here? Okay, that's 3db, right. Here we go. In language, in a few many words, you begin with a small sentence. In arithmetic, in a few many words, you begin with a small sentence. Now, if you do this experiment carefully, you get a 3 dB improvement in the lowering of the threshold when you add the 20 milliseconds. So it's a very significant difference in the audibility of the direct sound. And, and I find this, this really very cool. Now I'm going to play this, this smaller space. It's one of the reasons Symphony Hall works. That's one of the reasons Symphony Hall works. Now I'm going to play it says Logi, which isn't really quite fair because it's not Logi, but um, it sounds a lot like techno. <laughs> in language, in a few many words, can you be with small set of letters? In arithmetic, in many few many numbers can be composed from just a few digits, with the help of the symbol zero, the principle of position, and the concept of base. In the language, in very few many words can be written with a small set of letters. In arithmetic, in very few many numbers can be composed from just a few digits. With well, you can localize it, but it doesn't grab you. At least it doesn't grab me. Um, just as, uh, as something else now, I'm going to show you what happens if I play that, but I'm going to play this with the 20 millisecond added delay. Okay. Same directory reverberation. In language, in a very few many words, can be written with a small set of letters. In arithmetic, in a very few many lines, can be composed from just a few digits. With the help of the symbol zero, the print. I find that interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. That has some attention grabbing qualities. Okay. Um, That's just because she sounds like Julie Andrews. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it is. <laughs> well, I was going to wonder, you know, does the fact that her accent uh, is, is present, you know, an accent to us, yeah. does that change our perception of it? I don't know. I can play this in Japanese. It's, it's the same result, at least to me. And we don't understand Japanese. I know, so it really doesn't matter. What I'm trying to say is that I think this is purely a, a human thing. In fact, I, I have in one of my slides, which I may not to get to, because the people are probably going to tell me to stop talking because I've been talking now for, uh, well, it's only an hour. Is that right? <laughs> seven, 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 seven. No, 6.30. Six six right. Okay, let's all I'll talk for an hour. Okay, we can get comfortable for this. And, yeah, um, I... I went to this ILA conference at, in, in Copenhagen. Um, and uh, uh, this is when they were building the, the new hall in Oslo. Um, Have you been to it? Yes. And um, I, I, I don't know what John's doing. No, I was looking for my drink. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, uh, um, I got into this argument with Thor Holmrost, who is the guy who specified the uh, properties of, of the new hall in Oslo. Uh, in, in Oslo, and I, he said that we're specifying a reverb time of two seconds. No, he said 1.7. He said 1.7. He said that's an awful lot for an opera house. Um, I said, oh yeah, I know, but it's but you know it's what we really want. I'm sure it's good. I said, really? Okay. Um, 
I said, but you know, you're not going to hear the words very well at one point, second, seconds in an opera house. He says, it doesn't matter. There's these titles, you know. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, he said, it's always in Italian. <laughs> Nobody in Norway knows Italian. <laughs> you should tell them a little bit about that. Where it is. Maybe I'll get there. <laughs> Um, anyway, so that was at the that was at the Copenhagen conference, and we you're here we are in Copenhagen, and they just built this new opera house. And I said, anybody going to the opera? <laughs> well, I knew I knew uh, Michael Schoenhardt, so I called him up. I said, any chance I can go to the opera? And he, he, he gave me tickets. He said, can't possibly get you any tickets. He said they're all sold out. Been sold out for months at Siegfried for everything. Um, and he said, but you can go get Rush. So. In about 10 o'clock in the morning, um, I, I was running out of the conference, get the papers, I'm going to go down and get rush tickets. And Larry Kierkegaard says, where are you going? I said, I'm going to get rush tickets to Siegfried. He said, get me too. And so, uh, so I did. Now I got the last three tickets. And they were all the way up in the back, the back row of the third balcony. So it wasn't bad. Okay. Very far away. You need binoculars, but you know, it wasn't too bad. So, but in the fourth act, Larry said, you know, nobody can stand through four hours of secret. He said, let's go down to the floor, but it's got to be some empty seats. <laughs> <laughs> so we left the white up in there and, and went down. And he went on one side and went and said, there's no seat. Finally, finally, you know, the orchestra's about to come in. I see one. And I go, Larry sneaks into one from the other side. And you share the one. <laughs> And, and uh, no, I mean he got one too on the other side. So they were, you were, you know, sort of in, in one third and the two thirds point on the floor. And his wife's still upstairs. His wife's still upstairs. They're she, not was <laughs> <laughs> she was happy. She was happy. And uh, and I had my little microphones. The, the, those days I had microphones on top of the glasses and not in the eardrums. So I recorded the sound down there and I went back and played it for Eckhart Kayla. Eckhart, I don't know anybody. Anybody here know Eckhart Kayla? He is. He is, he is a wonderful character. Uh, he's a professional violist. He's maybe Europe's best acquisition at this point. I don't know anybody I'd rather work with, I think. Um, and he's the one who specified the properties of the new Paris Opera House, among other things. Worked on lots of projects. And um, I played this for him, and he said, I can't understand a single word, and I'm German. <laughs> <laughs> so take that for whatever it is worth. Where was I? I think I, I, oh, I want to show you one more thing about this. Okay. I'm going to play this without the direct sound. And I want you to concentrate really, well, first of all, I'm going to raise the direct sound enough so that even the people in the back can hear it clearly. So that's a direct reverb and ratio of minus eight. All right, minus eight. And I'm going to play this without the direct sound and I want you to concentrate on how enveloping and how loud the reverberation is. Not the direct sound. Well, first I'm not playing it with no direct sound. So think about how loud it is. And then when I turn the direction sound, uh, think about how loud the reverberation is when the direct sound is on and how enveloping it is. Okay, here it goes. In language, infinitely many words can be written with a small set of letters. In arithmetic, infinitely many numbers can be composed from just a few digits, with the help of the symbol zero, the principle of position, and the concept of base. In language, infinitely many words can be written with a small set of letters. In arithmetic, infinitely many numbers can be composed from just a few digits, with the help of the symbol zero, the principle of position, and the concept of base. In language, infinitely many words can be written with a small set of letters. In arithmetic, infinitely many numbers can be composed. Okay. What do you think? Does anybody hear a change in the loudness or the envelopment? Envelopment goes down. Envelopment goes down when I have the direct sound? Mm -hmm. Oh, not for me. Anybody well, you're else? Localizing to it. Huh? You're localizing to it. Oh, you're localizing to it, but I'm not, I'm telling you, ignore the, the, the direct sound. Just oh, wipe it out of your right. head. Sorry. You're only listening to the reverberation. Shall I play it again? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, here it goes. First, no. In language, infinitely many words can be written with a 
the smaller set of letters. In arithmetic, infinitely many numbers can be composed in just a few digits, with the help of the symbol zero, the principle of position, and the concept of weight. In language, infinitely many words can be written with a small set of letters. In arithmetic, infinitely many numbers can be composed from just a few digits, with the help of the symbol zero, the right. principle of position, and the concept of base. Okay, um, the problem here is that this, the direct sound is too loud for the people in the front, and I made it loud enough for the people in the back, but so that it's kind of distracting. But, but to me, when I switch the direct sound, the, the, the hall goes boing, like that. And it gets louder, too. It's more enveloping, and it's louder when you hear the direct sound. Ain't that strange? All right. I think you've pretty much heard what I was going to say in the second part of this talk by now. But I'm just going to, I'm going to, very quickly run through a few of these these slides um, uh, because well I pretty much already said this these are pictures again of, of pitch discrimination and different reverberations that was that was the thing I played when I first started you know where the, the, it was clear um, uh, when there was no all pass filters and then you put the all pass filters in and this happens okay yeah. Um, and uh, this is the two second reverberation time, that's the one second reverberation time. Um, here is, is, I was gonna do some experiences I've had, um, and these, these recordings were made not at my eardrums, but with uh, microphones just above the pinna on my glasses. And consequently, there's no forward vocalization notch at eight kilohertz. Consequently, when I play it on loud speakers, it sounds pretty good. If I play the true binaural ones, they don't sound as good on that because of these do. But you'll get some idea. This is a live performance of uh, Heinl um, in the Stubbs of Berlin. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was not given very good seats here. I was up here. Um, and one of my microphones died. But I can play <laughs> this in mono. <laughs> Dry. Very close. Very close. This was um, Don Carlos. Not Don Carlos. No, uh, Forza del Destino. And, and God, these, these Russians, they can make it so passionate. And, and the singers get up there and they sing with these enormous voices and, and it's absolutely dry and it hits you like a sledgehammer. It's, it's dramatically just a ringer. It's, it's amazing to hear opera in that, in that house. So you say, well, it's dry. That means the orchestra doesn't sound good. Well, and it's not amplified, right? Mm -hmm. It's not amplified. Not amplified. Oh, they have enormous voices, these guys. Good boy, you want to amplify it. Oh, really? Um, then uh, the next day I was, I was there and they, I got a ticket. Um, I got a ticket down here, right about here, um, and and heard um, she's out the, the ballet. The microphone was working. It's a stereo. It's not dry. Why is it not dry? Because they play the reverb. They know how to play the ball. They play the reverb. It's wonderful. Okay, let's go to Dresden. Someday we should do a talk about the difference between Russian orchestras and any other. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> they play dreadfully out of tune, and they can't possibly play together. But it's beautiful. <laughs> They, it is the vodka. <laughs> <laughs> I was there as long because as everyone's drinking. I was there because right next to the old Bolshoi is the new Bolshoi. 
That's this. And it's built as a model of the Drazen Chopper. And it sounds lovely. <laughs> in the reverberant level, and the singer went back 10 feet. I tried, I tried that later um, with, with uh, um, um, Hainton on the, po on, the, on the podium. And no, it was, wasn't Hainton, no, it was, it was Schoenewald. It was Schoenewald in Copenhagen. And he was conducting away on the, and I said, eh, I could raise that level of half a dB, half a dB up. <laughs> Put it back, he said. Steven's there. <laughs> so you think these guys can't hear it? This is the Copenhagen news stage. I told you about that already. This is Krokstad's slide from the IOA Oslo. Um, what we need to do to succeed in getting new audience to come to classical music is to make it engaging. And it's not. We need to make the sonic impression of the concert engage the audience, not just the visual and social perception, especially since audiences are increasingly accustomed to recordings. Maybe a recording that sounds distant. <laughs> Nobody would buy it. Well, are, is he saying to reduce reverberation, reverberation times, or reverberation levels? No, no, no. He's not approaching it as a scientist. He's, He's saying it's engaging. got to be engaging. All right. He's also an acoustician. He knows what he's doing. At the end of this lecture, I sent this slide somewhere. He said, he showed a picture of the Teatro de, de Colón in Buenos Aires. And he said, is this the concert hall of the future? Were they out for work? No, no, no. <laughs> the, have you been to the Teatro de Colón? No. No, it's about a 1.6 second reverberation time. It's a, it's a semicircular hall like Chicago, for example. Mm -hmm. Only it's absolutely gorgeous. You ask. Leo about, you say, Leo, what do you think about this? Oh, he says, one of the absolutely greatest concert halls in the world. He said, he said I, I have never talked to a single conductor who's been there who doesn't think it's in one of the, it's one of the very best. Mm -hmm. Reason, you can hear it in every scene, and it's reverberant at the same time. Engagement, not nice. What is auditory engagement? Well, I've talked about this. I just want to go through this quick because because I'll get on to the very third part. Um, these are experiments. I decided that maybe, I, I don't know how to get this engagement thing, and I didn't know how to do near and far either. So I said, maybe I can figure out how to do this by azimuth. I said, it seems that when I can hear azimuth, it's engaging. When I can't hear azimuth, it's not. So I'm going to study azimuth, because it's easy to do. You can study the threshold for azimuth. And I did it this way. I had a source, I had a source which alternated back and forth like this. Okay. And you, increase, you decrease the direct observant ratio until it drops to the middle. Okay? Say, so, okay, that's the threshold. Well, some people, it turns out some people can do this and some people can't do it at all. Um, so it, it, it's a difficult experiment, but it works very well for me. And I got these kinds of, of curves out of it. First of all, I found the lowest threshold here at 1 kilohertz. And at 500 hertz and 250 hertz, the threshold is way up there. Now, this shows that 2 kilohertz is being worse, but I found out later that was an artifact in the experiment. If you do the experiment right, 2 kilohertz lies right along the 1 kilohertz line. 
Also, it, it turns out that the gaps between the notes matter. Clearly, if the reverberation is masking the following note, it's not going to help you localize it. So that's obvious. Um, I'm going to then I went to this experiment where I had a direct sound again, plus or minus 15 degrees binaural, followed by a binaural reverberation, which was synthesized from, from noise. And I did a lot of experiments with this. And I came up with this wonderful way of telling you whether you could localize it or not with an equation. I, I can't really explain this, but I'll just briefly say that if you think about, um, about this is an impulse response. I measured a binaural impulse response in the occupied hall. Don't ask me how I did it. Um, and uh, if, you, if you think about the rate of nerve firings from the direct sound, um, it's, it's, I'm assuming you have like a, a note which starts quickly and holds for a while, all right? And when the note starts, you get nerve firings from the direct sound, and they just keep going because the direct sound doesn't stop, okay? But the reverberation, of course, when the direct sound starts, there's no reverberation. It hasn't started yet. So it takes a while for it to build up. And it builds up with this inverse time constant. Of course, that's the inverse of an exponential. So it's exactly what you expect to get. All right. Um, and then I said, OK, well, if we integrate the area of this and we integrate the area of this, if the two areas are equal, then you're at the threshold of localization. If the area of the pink is larger than the area of the blue, you hear it fine. And it turns out that works. It's great. It really works. I can show you what happens if I go to the, that was a one second reverberation time, okay, to minus 10 dB. And this is a two second reverberation time, minus 10 dB. And you notice that because it takes longer for the reverb to build up, there's less reverb in this 100 millisecond window. So this is actually very audible, and the other one was right at threshold. And if you put that in mathematics, it looks like this. This is on my website. And so then uh, I, the version I put on there turned out to be wrong. And some very nice man named Professor Ichiro Omoho in, in Kyushu, um, who I visited, uh, pointed out to me that it was absolute nonsense. Um, <laughs> and I managed to fix it. So this is the right one. And I think everyone agrees. And I even went through and, and wrote something about how to explain it. I wrote, wrote you the MATLAB code if you want to calculate it. Okay, so that's all on my website. Um, I, I don't have time to go through all this, so I'm going to skip it. This is the speech test I was using. Let me just play it for you just to show you what it sounds like. One, two, three, four, it's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's enough of a pause so the reverberation eight, from the first nine, one doesn't ask ten. the next one. And it just alternates left and right like that. Um, all right, so what I did was I, I measured my own thresholds using that signal. And, and I got the, uh, the lines with the circles. Um, and this is for one second reverb, and that's for two second reverb. And this is added delay in milliseconds. And it, and it turns out the equation that I showed you matches these values pretty much exactly. So that's where that equation comes from. Now, the interesting thing about that equation, you can see, is I used the 100 millisecond window. If I don't use a 100 millisecond window, it doesn't work. So that's the origin of the 100 millisecond window in the other model. Um, it came from this, and that's the justification for it, basically. All right. I'm going to talk about acoustics now for the next 10 minutes or until you walk out, <laughs> whichever comes sooner. Um, the ability to hear direct sound is measured by LOC or something else is a vital component of the sound quality of great hall. You can get some conclusions from this. One of them is that hall's shape does not scale. Here, let me give this back to you before I forget. Say what LOC. Huh? Say what LOC. That's that equation I just said. That's, that's the, it's localization. That's what I called it, the localization, LOC. Localizability. Okay. I don't know. I'm actually much more interested in this, this real-time model where you actually use speech as an input. Because try and find the binaural impulse response of a fully occupied and fallen stage. Very hard to find. Warning, talk contains con concepts that contradict deeply held convictions. <laughs> I propose that reflections, often early reflections in the time range of 10 to 100 milliseconds, reduce clarity, envelopment, and engagement. Ha. True. 
These are easy to demonstrate. And I did demonstrate it. I just did. Tell I'm not saying... 100 millisecond? Hmm? To 100 millisecond? To 100 mil Well, that's the width of this window. All right. Reflections you above... You think that's radical? Well, what's radical right now, most acquisitions will tell you that the more early reflections you have in the range of 50 to 100 milliseconds that come from the side, they're absolutely vital for making a good hole. They will tell you that. Yeah. And they design the holes to maximize those. Yeah. And they're absolutely nuts. <laughs> okay, that's radical. That's radical. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay, measurements in Boston Symphony Hall above 1,000 hertz show a clear double slope that's not visible at, 1, at 500 hertz. The hall has high engagement in my estimate of at least 70% of the seats. Okay, I sit in row R typically. Um, I've been in your seats in row N, they're very nice. Um, you're, you're in row N? N22. N22, right. And um, I've sat in row W um, right at the profile, and that's sort of okay. Yeah, that's um, good. Row that's BB, good. for example, I don't want to sit no. there. Downstairs. Downstairs. Yeah. Um, uh, if you're in the first two or three rows in the balcony, first balcony, the passion. Very interesting. Why does the why does the clarity come back in the front of the first balcony that's lost 20 rows sooner on the floor? We need better measures. There's no measures for this. LOC is the first one that I've been able to come up with that makes sense. Whether it's useful or not, I don't know. Um, uh, Mono-san is actually trying to apply it to some holes and maybe get some data on that, which is wonderful. Um, we need measures that use binaural recordings of actual performances as inputs. I made this slide before I actually had such a thing, and now I do. What will come of it, I don't know. It's too early. Um, this mechanism I just showed you has probably taken two million years or so to evolve, <laughs> would be my guess. And I've worked it on it for about three months, so <laughs> don't expect a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, we need better measures, yeah. Why do large holes sound different? Okay, well, this was this what started all this, actually. Somebody asked me to write a paper about Boston Symphony in Amsterdam, and I was supposed to use mathematical equations to describe how it sounds. And I looked and said, you can't do that. <laughs> um, and I, I, so I thought about it and said, you know, it can't be the reverberation because the reverberation is too much the same. Um, and in fact, it's not. Um, if, you, if you look at, I made a model, okay, this, these are just stupid um, uh, image source models. But actually, image source models are accurate. If you assume that all the surfaces have the same afflictivity, mm. it's accurate. Okay, well, that's a big assumption. It's not true. Um, but you at least can learn something from it. Um, if you look at Amsterdam, you find that um, the LLC value you get from that model, this is, this is 7 tenths of the way back. Um, is plus 6. And if you go to Boston Symphony, it's less. It's 4.2, but that's still very good. Very highly localizable and, and engaging in both holes. I love, I love Amsterdam. But it's different. And why is it different? Well, Amsterdam is square, you know, so the audience sits closer. 7 tenths of, of the way back has more direct sound. It's also wider, which means the lateral flexions come later. Good. Also very helpful. But also the orchestra is a lot farther away from what would be considered the back wall behind them. Yes, yeah, that, that's true. The back wall is, in general, is really detrimental. A bunch of seats. But it's not so bad in the symphony. Um, but that's a whole other story. But I guess we're going to get that into that. Okay, well, so I com compared the answer, uh, comparison C80, C50, I, C80, and LOC in those two models. So what's different? Well, it turns out C80 is not significantly different. They're both about half of one half. DB. They're different by tenths of a dB. C50, same thing, tenths of a dB. ICC actually is different. Not a lot, but it's different. And the LSC is different. Okay. And as I said, the problem with ICC is it ignores, it ignores any medial reflections. And at least half of your reflections are medial. Now, the interesting thing is you can take Boston Symphony and say, okay, let's make it smaller by a factor of two. So it'll hold what? Instead of 2,700 seats, it holds 800? Something like that. Well, there's a lot of concert halls in the world that look like Boston Symphony, half size. They're building them. They must build four a year. 
if you look. I mean, people are building concert halls all over the world. They say, well, a concert hall has to look like Boston Symphony, right? Everybody knows that's what it looks like. But if you, if you take Boston Symphony and make it by a factor of two, look what happens to the LSC value. Small halls. What if we build a hall with the shape of Boston Symphony but half the size? Hold 600 seats, RT will be one second, half the size, half of RT. Time is time. <laughs> um, we would expect the average d d direct reverberation ratio to be the same. Is it? How does the new hall sound? If, if the client specified a one point second RT and you took out all the absorption to make that happen, would it sound better or worse? A lot worse. <laughs> okay, here's the half size Boston. There's the LSD, 0.5. Notice the huge reverberation. Why is the direct reverberation ratio, at least the direct reverberation ratio in this window, so much worse in this one than it was in the other? It shouldn't change, wouldn't you think? And the answer is it does change. And that's because the reverberation builds up so much quicker. You forgot about. Well, what would the initial concert like have to be? Small like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here's here's Pikmin. There's a bunch of stuff I did that I won't go into that because it was all very interesting and I learned a lot from it. And I'm going to do want to point out that great small halls exist. And people, we feel we in Boston know what they are. This is Jordan. Um, I love Jordan, but not for chamber music if the chamber musicians are back here. Because this stage house is murdered. But if you're in front of the proscenium, it is fabulous. This is Williams, which is really good for a small piano recital. It is fantastic. I don't know how many, how many people know it's Williams Hall? Any few? Fewer people. Okay. Now look at the stage. Hey, what's about the stage? What's what's in the back of the stage? How many people make a concert hall these days with curtains in the back of the stage? Zero. <laughs> Is that a good idea? Well, I asked a really good pianist what she thought of, of those curtains and the sound on the stage. Oh, that's great. You can hear the piano really well. Well, what happens? If you have curtains all around like this, what does that do to the direct to reverb ratio? Huh? It makes the direct sound. Much stronger than the reverberation. You've, you've soaked up half the, half the reverberation by this. So the clarity in this place is wonderful. The reverberation time must be 1.4 or something like that. It's pretty reverberant for small hall. This is a place to go listen to music. And not a shoebox that looks like half-size Jordan Hall. All right. Light models I won't go into. Here's the, the bottom line, or a bottom line. In a large hall like Boston has many seats above the threshold of LOC and many that are near the threshold. I'm saying these are near and these are below, but you might want to argue with it. And certainly the first balcony is good. And I'll get to that why that in a minute. If you not, make that the hall not under the first balcony. Huh? But not under. Not under. <laughs> but uh, and if this hall is reduced in size while preserving the shape, this is what you get. All the good seats go to the front, but all these of course are too loud. So you get up, you have, you have your choice of being unclear and too loud, or unclear and okay, and clear and too loud. It's better to use a design that reduces the average seating distance using a high ceiling to increase the volume. Boston's blessed with two 1,200 seat halls with the third shape Jordan and Sanders. I was just talking to Mark Kroll, and I hate playing in Sanders. He's like, why do you hate playing in Sanders? There's no bass reverb. Absolutely right, no bass reverb. Tongue and groove everywhere. Leaks like a sieve. I've, I've talked to her, but wouldn't you like me to add just a little something with B to make that low reverberation come back? No, oh, no, we couldn't possibly do that. <laughs> <laughs> David, I just uh, about a month ago heard the Mahler Knight at Jordan and the next day at Sanders, same orchestra, same conductor. And the difference in the performance because of the difference in acoustics was remarkable. It was a much, much prettier performance at Sanders, much more powerful than Jordan. But the, uh, I, would, I actually preferred the sound I heard at, at Sanders because the performance was so much more beautiful. Uh, 
Well, the, the thing is about tap mixing is the stage, I, as musicians about tap too many, they don't like playing it because you can't hear usually across the stage. But in the audience, it's so wonderful. I mean, the clarity you get from the instrument on the center stage is so much better than what you get in Jordan because that, that the stage house in Jordan is just a big reverberant hole and it muddies everything up. Whereas the, the center, well, see, Boston doesn't have that. Boston, the, the stage house in Boston, fortunately, is half that deep. So it throws all that sound right into the hall and it doesn't bounce around in there. And, and, and it's just such a much clearer stage. <coughs> That's the big difference between Avery Fisher and, and Symphony. If, if they cut that stage in half in Avery Fisher, it would be at least a decent hall, not a good one, but a decent one. Well, narrow. I wouldn't well, narrow it. No. Wouldn't. The problem, that's what I'm about to talk about next. The big problem, the big difference between Boston Symphony and Avery Fisher and Kennedy in Washington is this and that. Okay. Those coffers, what do the coffers do? What do those niches do? Yes, oh, everybody says diffusion. You can have a thousand kinds of different kinds of diffusion. A very specific kind of diffusion is happening. Okay, they are retroreflectors. If the wavelength of the sound is small compared to the size of the niche, it goes back where it came from. Hmm? Like optically, like a cat's eye reflector. Yeah. Or, or a reflector, a, you know, a radar reflector that you put on your phone. You know, it's, they're all square things. Um, what is the point of that? It means that. And, and these are, are about this, this deep, you know? Yeah. And that's 18 inches, that's 700 hertz. Well, 1400 hertz maybe, depending on how you think about it. But what's happening is high frequencies do this, and they go right back to the orchestra, and the orchestra loves it. Okay? And what does that mean? It means that the people in the back of the hall don't hear it. <laughs> so the direct reverberant ratio above 1000 hertz goes up. And that's just what I saw in Larry's data. You get this, you get this high amount of early energy in Boston, and below 500, below 1,000 hertz, you don't see it. It's gone. Why? Because below 1,000 hertz, it does that. If you sit in the second balcony, in the back of the second balcony, and cup your ears and look at the ceiling, you will hear that. <laughs> What's coming off the ceiling is a wonderful, wonderful sound. Exactly. Okay. Um, I don't particularly like the sounds up there. <laughs> it's better, I think, in the first balcony. But anyway, I have fun little well, recordings, it's, incidentally. You can I listen to those. Because of the tone that that gives you. Yeah, yeah, no, you'd be a little surprised. Um, but um, the point is that to get the kind of clarity, the kind of engagement you want, you really want to do this. You really want to get that to happen. Now, the reason that the, the, the seats are bad below the cross, be, further back from the cross aisle in Boston Symphony is because the, these lateral reflections come off the wall. And if, if you think about it, you, you see that the, the strength of the lateral reflections compared to the direct sound is always going up as you go back because uh, when you're in the front of the hall, the, the reflection's got to do this and the direct sound just does like that. So it might be six decibels different, the, the reflection six decibels lower. As you go back in the hall, that becomes four and then it becomes be three and then it becomes two. But worse than that, you have a balcony surface, the first balcony. The orchestra plays here, it hits the balcony ceiling, it hits the wall, and it hits you. It also does this, dig, dink, you get it twice. We're talking about the sidewall. The sidewall. So you get a sidewall reflection, and you get a second sidewall reflection off the ceiling. They come almost at the same time, and they're twice as strong as they would be if there was only one. And as, as you move back, that, that reaches the point where it wipes you out. It doesn't happen in the front of the first balcony. Why? There's no wall. It's all absorbed by the audience. It can't do that. It, the, the reflection that would otherwise hit you up there is hit the ceiling and gone into the orchestra. It doesn't get to you. Okay. So it's wonderful yeah. up there. Yes. The curtain on the front wall and uh, you know in the front of Williams affects the back of the room. I would think so. Yes. I don't know Williams enough to answer that question accurately. But I think the biggest change that happened to Jordan when Larry redid it 10 years ago, 15 years ago, with great, lots and lots of complaints, 
when, when that first opened, was removing of the overhead curtain from the top of the stage. Because what happens, it's exactly what happens with that, you see, is, is, is a lot of the frequencies, but particularly the high frequencies from the orchestra, is absorbed by that curtain before it can go into the hall. And that increases the direct reverberation ratio at frequencies above 1,000 hertz, which is just what you want to have happen. So when, when that came out, I, went, I measured before and after. It only made it two tenths of a second uh, difference in the reverberation time. But the reverberation level, I was not able to measure at that time. But I'm pretty sure it changed rather dramatically, particularly at higher frequencies. Incidentally, the same thing happened in Carnegie. Yes, it did. And, and I, I, I had a long conversation with Larry about that, who was brought in to try and fix what uh, what's her name had done, uh, Isaac Stern and uh, Beverly Sills. Uh, and and, uh, and he, he told me, he said, you know, the real problem is when they took that curtain away from the front of Carnegie, the sound changed dramatically for the worse. And, and he said, I, I can't put it back. It's politically impossible to put it back. Um, but we're doing, trying to mitigate it by putting felt on things. Well, the trouble is the felt only absorbs above, above about 6 kilohertz. And the problem is at 1 kilohertz. So the felt ain't going to do it. So I'm going to stop here.